Good morning, everybody. Please take a seat. Um, so, as you may have seen in your email, uh, the you know the little seesaw, you know the little test bed thing, experimental thing that you can do at home, uh, has finally arrived. Uh, we got there at least the first batch. Um, so. Uh, we we'll just had to manage the logistics of, you know, just getting them to you. So uh, I imagine that, um, you know, if Julian gets here or, you know, just get in touch with Julian, uh, the head TA, uh, so that you can get your own, um, your own. Uh, okay. <laughs> These are the scissors. Uh, okay. So you have a big box. Julian is there in the back. Um, uh, Julian, how do you want to uh, organize this? Okay, so during the break, then we will take care of it. So, uh, as I said, we don't have enough for everybody yet, uh, but, you know, I imagine that you can form groups or, uh, you know, share, uh, you know, some of these units so that you can start playing with them and seeing that, um, <laughs> surprisingly, what we do in this class, uh, even though it has all these complex numbers, all these kind of abstract things, is actually very applicable to this, to the real world, you know, to the design of a real world controller for these real world systems. Okay. Good. Let's get started uh, with today's lecture. Um, so, as you see here, we are getting to the end of this, uh, you know, big chunk uh, of the lectures. So, essentially, what we'll do today is we will look at the last uh, analysis tool. Okay. So. Uh, the last tool that you will use to understand what will happen uh, or, or how would a certain system behave when you close the loop, okay? Um, uh, this is in particular called, the, something is called the Nyquist uh, criterion, the, the Nyquist condition. Um, so just bear with us with this one last lecture where we do analysis, and then from next week onwards, we will do design. Finally, okay? So finally, from next time, we get to do some engineering, okay? Uh, but unfortunately, you need to know everything that up to and including today to understand what will be the effects of your design, okay? So uh, what will be the consequences of certain decisions, okay? So um, unfortunately, I was not here last week, or maybe fortunately. Um, <laughs> Uh, I hope that, uh, you know, Jacopo, you know, was able to give a good lecture on these uh, body plots. Um, what we'll do today is, um, okay, something that you have to understand is that, you know, all these like root locus, body plots, you know, pole zero maps, transfer functions, whatever. Um, these are things that may sound a little bit arcane, you know, like difficult to understand at the beginning. The, the reality of it is that actually the more and more of these things you do, the more and more of a mechanism it becomes, you know, just follow the rules and, you know, sketch these plots, okay? You will get to the point where you will do all this. So now we'll probably take you 15 minutes to do any one of these. You will get to the point where it will take you a few seconds, okay? Not the Nyquist plot. The Nyquist plot is different, but... Is useful. So uh, let's get started. So let's do one more example of these um, uh, body plots, okay? So somebody comes to you uh, and gives you the transfer function of a system, okay? Or maybe you buy a system, you build a system, and then you do some, you know, you essentially it's a process called system identification, right? So you have your system, you know it's stable for whatever reason because you decide it to be so. Um, uh, and then you just feed it sinusoid at the input. What you know is that the output, you will get the sinusoid with different magnitude, different phase, right? So you can construct this, um, you know, this transfer function, okay? So somebody gives you a transfer function like that. You look at it, oh my goodness, it's complicated, you know, it's all these S's, all these numbers. I have no idea what that means, okay? But what we want to do is draw the body plot of this, for whatever reason, we will see the reason you know, at the end of this lecture, okay? So how do we do that? Okay, again, you know, just follow the rules, follow the steps, you will not get in trouble, okay? So the first thing that I do when I had to draw a body plot is really rewrite your transfer function in what we call the body form. 
Body form is essentially the form where all of these polynomials or, um, are essentially written in such a way that they have a one on the zero order term, okay? On the constant term, you have a one, positive one. Okay, why do we want to do that? It's essentially because, you know, this way, if you set S to zero, then you just have a bunch of ones, okay? And then you have the coefficient that is in front of the function, okay? So you can either do this and write it down, or you do it in your head, doesn't matter. You know, probably as you get started, you want to write it down, okay? But the point is, don't forget to do that, okay? Because when you want to draw the body plot, you really want to have all the constant terms just to be one, okay? Then what you will do is now draw the body plot for each of these factors in the transfer function, okay? The whole point, I don't know if Jacopo, you know, made this explicit or, uh, you know, if you kind of like figure it out. Why do we want to go through the trouble of drawing the magnitude plot on a logarithmic scale? And the phase plot is on a linear scale. Because if you do that, we know that when you multiply two terms, the magnitudes multiply, which means that the log of the magnitudes add, right? And we know that the phases add, okay? So nothing to be done there, right? So if you plot the, if you draw the body plot of each one of the factors, then doesn't matter how complicated the transfer function is, what you do is just add them up. You just add the logs of the magnitudes, you add the faces. That's it, okay? And that's your final body plot. So let's get started. Okay, look at this thing. Um, okay, what is the very first factor? The very first factor is four, okay? So what, is, uh, what does uh, four look like on the body plot? Um, yeah. It will be a straight line, right? And, okay, so we know, what is this straight line? So, okay, I'm really sorry, I apologize for the whole controls community, but somehow somebody many years ago decided that it was a good thing to measure things in decibel. <laughs> there is absolutely no reason to do that. It's just something that was done, I, you know, from my point of view, it's just to make your life more miserable. Um, but well, that's the way that the community has evolved, okay? Um, if you want to forget completely about decibels and just mark this as, you know, okay, this is just 10 and this is just 20, uh, sorry, uh, 100, this is 1,000, that's also fine, okay? Anyway, for whatever reason, 10, you know, people in controls, when they, when they, say, when they want to say 10, they say 20 dB whatever, okay? So anyway, so if 10 is 20 dB, how much is four? Um, we, on this logarithmic scale, you know, it will be somewhere, you know, around here, okay? So we know that the factor four, the black factor, is a straight line, okay? Uh, how about the phase of four? The phase of four is just zero, right? So we start, you know, the black line is just zero here, okay? Let's, let's start with the, you know, fun stuff now. <laughs> what is the uh, body plot of the green factor? You know, it's one over S, you know, what we call an integrator. When S is equal to uh, one, okay? Sorry, when S is equal to J times one, the frequency is one, uh, what is the uh, magnitude of that? It's one over one, it's just one, right? So uh, we'll be somewhere here. What is the phase of one over, um, you know, one over S? One over J omega, right? Whatever uh, omega is, uh, the phase of that, if omega is positive, the phase of that is, um, um, 
is negative 90 degrees, okay? The face of that is negative 90, okay? What is the magnitude? Well, it's something that decreases at what people in control say 20 dB per decade, which also means that if you increase the frequency by 10, the magnitude of one over g omega decreases by a factor of 10, okay? So at the end of the day, you know, this is the, um, this is the plot of the magnitude, this is the plot of the phase, okay? Next one, what is the body plot of S over four plus one? Uh, what we know is we write it this way, if when S goes to zero, that is omega goes to zero, then this factor is just one, right? So the point of doing this is, okay, so let's pick the red color, is that you know that this body plot will start from magnitude zero dB, right, which is one, okay? Zero dB is one, right? The logarithm of one is zero, okay? And then what happens? Okay, so this is a zero, so we know that the, um, uh, the zero is at about, uh, is at four, right? So it will be, uh, is here, right? So we have the zero there, okay? And we know that the asymptotic body plot is something that would be flat up to the point where you get to, to four, and then we'll go up by 20 dB per decade, okay? Okay? What happens to the magnitude? We know that the magnitude starts at zero, right? And then at this point will be positive 45 and will eventually go to plus 90, right? And you can draw it by, you know, people usually draw it as, you know, uh, starting from one decade earlier, so it will be around here. Sorry, uh, I made a little bit of a mess. Um, okay, uh, let's do it again. So at this point will be about 45 degrees, um, and this will start from uh, one say say, uh, okay, at z low frequencies will be zero, and then one decade before the zero will start going up, and then you know will eventually be positive 90. Okay, what is the last factor? The last factor is the blue one. Um, so what are the poles in this case? We know that the, um, you know, the second, so, the, so if you just multiply everything out, the, uh, the natural frequency squared will be 100, right? So we know that the natural frequency of these poles will be 10, okay? So what we know is that the, again, this pole will start from zero, we had these two poles at 10, right, around here. We have two of them, right? So then the magnitude will remain flat up to the point where we get to these two poles, right? And then it will go down by 20 dB per decade per each pole, for each pole. We had two poles, so this magnitude will go down by 40 dB per decade, okay? the slope of negative two, right? Two, uh, you multiply the frequency by 10, the magnitude will decrease by uh, 100, okay? What, what, the, what happens to the phase? The phase will be zero, up to the point where you have these two poles, right? Will be negative 90 here, and will be negative 180 eventually, okay? So now the, you know, this will be something along the lines of something like that, okay? Okay, so how do you add all of these things up? Okay, so let's draw uh, you know, another figure, maybe it's a bigger. Um, Okay, so essentially you start from, let's say from the left, say, okay? You start from this point. What you know is that, okay, so the black is four, 
like 4 dB, uh, sorry, um, is whatever dB corresponds to 4, okay? Um, I think it's about 12, okay? 12 dBs. Um, okay, so essentially you start from, you know, somewhere here. And then as you notice, we have the green line. The black line is a constant, right? The green line is just decreasing, right? So what you have is something that goes like that. Uh, sorry, it should be parallel to the green line, okay? Right, and then at this point, you see that I have the zero, right? So now I have the, the, the red line has a positive 20 dB per decade at this point, right? So that essentially, um, uh, I was going down by 20 dB per decade, now I had to steer up by 20 dB per decade, so essentially what happens is that the slope becomes flat, okay? Up to the point where I get to the two poles, and now the, uh, essentially I have two poles, so I steer down by 20 dB per decade per pole, right? So essentially the slope now becomes negative negative 20 dB per decade, okay? So essentially this is, this is your uh, magnitude body plot. What happens to the phase? Uh, okay, so we start from negative 90, okay? Uh, here we start seeing the effect of the zero, right? So we'll go up a little bit. Here we start seeing the effects of the two poles, okay? So actually here, you know, the first pole will make us go flat. Uh, the other pole is actually making us go down at the slope of, uh, you know, uh, of negative one slope in a sense, okay? And uh, the net effect is that, okay, so the zero will allow us to go to say plus 90, but I have two poles, which means that, you know, that will make us go to, um, uh, what is it? Um, uh, negative, so I have a total of three poles, which will bring us eventually to negative 270 degrees, okay? So then essentially what this will look like is, okay, so at this point I will start decreasing, okay? At this point I will start decreasing a little bit more uh, and essentially will go to uh, negative 270, okay? You understand more or less what is what is happening? Okay, how do you add all these things up? Um, honestly, the way I do it, which is a little bit, you know, <laughs> one step a little bit further, is, um, you know, I just look at this, okay. Um, I know that for frequency one, I will hit this point, okay? I know that coming from low frequencies, I have this integrator, so I will be coming down, I will be reaching this point, uh, okay, with a slope of negative 20, okay? So I know that, you know, coming from the left, I will be coming down with this direction, okay? Then what I actually do is I mark these things. I know that there is a zero here, and I know that there are two poles here, okay? So then, I just do this. I know that I'm coming from here, aiming at this point, just go down. As soon as I hit the, you know, the, the frequency where I have the zero, I know that I had to steer left by, <laughs> by 20 dB per decade, okay? So instead of going straight, what I will do, I will steer left, right? Okay. By 20, I was going down by 20 dB per decade, now I steer by positive 20 dB per decade, meaning that I go flat, okay? Then I hit the poles, I steer right by two times 20 dB per decade, and this is what I get, okay? Roughly five seconds, okay? Uh, eventually, it will not happen overnight, but eventually you will be able to sketch this body plot very efficiently. I know that I start from negative 90, I know that around the zero, the phase will go a little bit up, right? Because it wants to go to positive 90. Um, or no, to want to give a contribution of positive 90, right? But then I have here, I have these two poles. So then the phase will go down 
to, to negative 270 degrees. Okay? And that's how you sketch it. Oops, and of course I had a mistake, so sorry. Um, yeah. So I, I counted one too many. Um, um, yeah, so I should, so I, I should go 180 degrees down, um, um, you know, from the, uh, sorry. Um, just count, okay? So we have the zero, which gives me positive 90. I have the integrator, which gives me negative 90. And I had two poles that give me another uh, uh, negative 180. So the net is actually negative 180. Sorry about the mistake, okay? Okay? So I can erase this. Okay, and what you will see is that actually uh, compare this thing that I sketched, uh, you know, very quickly to what MATLAB gives you. And the two things are actually, you know, very similar. Okay? Okay? Fine. Okay, so this is, um, okay, something else that you may notice is that in the body plot, the slope of the magnitude and the phase are not independent, okay? And in particular, whenever you see a, you know, on the magnitude plot that the, that the phase, that the slope is constant for some stretch, you know, say a couple of decades, uh, then the phase actually corresponds to the slope, okay? So here we have a, um, sorry, um, here we have a slope of negative one, right? This corresponds to a phase of ne negative 90 degrees, okay? Um, so here we have a slope of negative two. This corresponds to a phase of negative 180 degrees. Okay? Here you do something funny. <laughs> so you see that the slope actually becomes, you know, from negative one goes to zero. But you see that it's not really for a long stretch. So I cannot really say that the phase here is zero. But you see that here the phase is actually increasing a little bit, right? And then goes to uh, negative 180. Okay? So this is something that you may want to use just to double check, okay, uh, the correctness of your body plot, okay? Now, uh, yet another form of, another plot that we can use is something called the polar plot, okay? Now, remember that when we are plotting the frequency response, what we are doing is we are plotting the function uh, uh, g of j omega, right? So. Omega is a real number, is the frequency, right? G of j omega, and you know, this is the complication, g of j omega is a complex number, right? So I can choose uh, to represent it as, as in the body plot, I plot the magnitude and the phase, or I can just choose to plot this function as a parametric plot on the complex plane, okay? For, I choose omega, J, G of J omega will be some complex number and they just plot that complex number on the complex plane, okay? So this is just another way of doing it. And this is exactly what people call the polar plot, okay? So essentially polar plot is just plotting G of J omega uh, as a parametric curve on the complex plane, okay? This polar plot is, you know, everybody hates to use it. Okay, to draw it, because actually there are no special rules for drawing it, okay? So and every time you have to think about, you know, how to do it. My recommendation is to never start from the polar plot directly, okay? But it's kind of complicated. There are no special rules to draw it, okay? However, what you can do is just plot the body plot first. We know how to draw the body plot, okay? And the body plot and the polar plot are exactly the same thing, just represented in different ways, okay? So then you look at the body plot, you look at the magnitude, what the magnitude does, what the phase does, and then you sketch the polar plot, okay? Also, something else that is important is, as in the root locus, right, so I told you, don't stress too much about the exact shape of the root locus. Same thing here. 
don't stress too much about the exact shape of the Nyquist plot. The only thing that matters in the Nyquist plot or the polar plot is where the plot intersects the unit circle, okay? And where the plot intersects the real axis. These are the only things that matter. You know, everything else is just color, okay? Okay? Uh, so let's, let's do it. So we want to draw the polar plot of an integrator, right? So one over S. I have absolutely no idea how to do it. Probably if you think, if you spend, you know, half an hour thinking about it, so I'm plotting the function one over J omega as omega changes. Maybe you can give just a few sample values to omega, and then you will understand what the, what the plot looks like. However, what you can also do is draw the body plot for the integrator, right? We know that this is something that has the phase is negative 90 throughout, and the magnitude is, you know, when, S, when the frequency goes to zero, the magnitude goes to infinity. When the frequency goes to infinity, the magnitude goes to zero, right? And this is the shape. So how do you draw this? on the complex plane. It's not that hard if you think about it. You have an idea? Huh? Well, what we look like? Since the angle always stays the same, it's just going to be... Exactly, right? So this is a line that, you know, will always be a 90 negative, you know, <laughs> negative 90 degrees, right? So it will be somewhere on the, uh, you know, uh, on the imaginary axis, right? In the negative side, right? And in a particular, will will be very large for very large magnitude for small frequencies, right? And then essentially, will go to zero for large frequencies, right? So as omega increases, then this is the polar plot. Okay. Now let's say that I have a single real stable pole. Okay. So now this is the uh, this is the body plot, right? And we know that starts with the frequency that with magnitude is about one, and then eventually the magnitude goes to zero. Okay. The phase starts at zero, right? And then eventually, you know, it decreases and then eventually goes to negative ninety. Okay. So what we know is that okay, in this particular case for low frequencies, when omega goes to zero. I start from 0 dB, which is 1, right? So I start about here, right? And the phase is 0. So I'm on the real axis, right? Then what I know is that, okay, so now the frequency, so for large, for very high frequencies, my magnitude is going to 0, but my phase is going to negative 90. So what does it mean is that I will eventually approach the origin, coming from below, right? Coming from negative 90 degrees, okay? So you can sketch it, the, pl the polar plot in this case is something like that, okay? You start, you start here where omega is zero, and then as omega becomes larger and larger, your magnitude decreases, your phase also decreases up to the point where the magnitude goes to zero and the phase goes to negative 90. Okay. You see how I'm constructing this polar plot? Look at the body plot and then draw it on the complex plane. Okay. Um, similar. Now I have complex uh, conjugate stable poles. Okay, with different um, with different damping ratios. So again, where do we start? When do I start for omega goes to zero? Questions? No? So, where do I start when omega goes to zero? Look at the body plot. Body plot, the magnitude is zero dB, which means one. Um, the phase is zero, right? So I start from here, okay? As the frequency increases for very high frequencies, my magnitude will go to zero and the phase goes to negative 180, right? So from where, so I will go to the origin, right? From where will I approach the origin? 
negative 180 degrees, which I approach the origin from the left, right? So I know that I will come in in this direction, okay? Now look at what happens to the phase, start from zero, and then decreases, right? So essentially what I'm doing, I'm going from here to here, okay? Now, as you, know, as you may notice, I, the way I drew it is in such a way that the magnitude is always less than one, right? So I really, what I drew is the, let's say, critically damped case, okay? But as you see, the body plot, um, you know, when the damping ratio is small, you actually have this resonance peak. You may have this resonant peak, which means that, for example, your, um, your magnitude may be greater than one, right? So what is the polar plot in that case? You see that I may exceed magnitude one, so I may stay out of, the, of, this, of this unit circle, right? At what phase? that's when the phase gets to about negative 90 degrees, right? So if I want to plot this, you know, the polar plot in the case in which I have a small damping ratio, then this will look something like this, okay? You see, see what, what's happening? The exact shape does not matter. The only thing that matters is where you cross the unit circle, okay, or whether you are outside of inside the unit circle, and where you cross the real line, okay, or where you cross or where you touch the real line. These are really the only two things that matter when drawing the border plot, okay? You can get as sophisticated as you want, will not help you, <laughs> okay? So just look at the body plot and try to translate that to the complex plane, yeah. It's coming. Give me, okay, ask me again at the end of the hour. Okay, and you will have your question, your, your answer. Yep. <laughs> okay, for negative frequencies. Um, what do you think will happen if I try to draw that for negative frequencies, which is actually what we will do? Any thoughts? It's the same, but upside down, okay? So thank you very much. Actually, that helps me in introducing the next plot, okay? So uh, uh, essentially the Nyquist plot roughly speaking, is the same thing as the polar plot, but done for frequencies that go from negative infinity to plus infinity, okay? And the Nyquist plot, the way you do it is just take the same thing and just draw, um, you know, just the symmetric, okay? Or, you know, it would be this one, okay? Okay, and then typically what you want to do is also you want to draw little arrows, right? Essentially, the arrows gives you uh, the direction in which the polar plot or this Nyquist plot moves as you increase omega, okay? We will see that the direction is actually important, okay? Does that answer your question? Okay, so yes, yeah, very important. So you want to do it for positive frequencies, but you may want, you also want to do it for negative frequencies. What does it mean to have a negative frequency? Don't ask, <laughs> okay? You don't, I mean, doesn't matter, okay, because, uh, uh, you know, does not have any physical meaning, however, makes the math easier and actually gives you a lot of results. Don't, don't think about it and just draw the plot, okay? Good. Um, super. Something more complicated like the one that we did before. Okay, so now what we know is that um, at low frequencies, we are coming from negative 90 degrees, and the magnitude will be very large, right? So essentially what we know is that, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm coming in from here, okay? Uh, then what? Uh, what you see is that actually the first effect, okay, so the, the magnitude is kind of 
monotonically decreasing. Okay, so we are getting closer and closer to the origin. But as you see here, the first effect is that actually the phase increases a little bit, right? Increases a little bit and then eventually goes to negative 180, okay? So I know that eventually I had to reach the origin from this direction. However, um, what will happen is that first I will move a little bit, you know, towards like a smaller phases, right? So I move in the direction of increasing phases, right? Where do I cross the one point? The, I cross the one point at a little bit more than negative, so a little bit more negative than negative 90, right? So essentially what I will do is something like that. Okay? You want to draw the Nyquist plot, uh, you know, just draw the symmetric. Okay? Uh, this is not a complete Nyquist plot because what we want to get on a Nyquist plot is essentially we want to get a closed curve. And here we have the question of, you know, we don't know how to close from this point to this point. Okay, so essentially here I'm getting to infinity. So, you know, essentially in a sense, um, you know, all of infinity is the same thing, okay? But I can change my phase. So now I don't know if I should close my plot this way or that way. Uh, but this is, we'll see it in, you know, during the next hour, okay? But as you see, you know, this is a very complicated uh, transfer function. If you wanted to reason about what the real part and the imaginary part of this transfer function is for different values of omega, it's a lot of calculations or, uh, or you know, just do it in MATLAB, right? But um, it's a lot of calculations in MATLAB too. Uh, on the other hand, I don't want to do that because I know how to build the, how to draw the body plot quickly and I can just use the body plot to plot the polar plot and the mirror image gives me the Nyquist plot, okay? Okay, uh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, what I was, I told you that, you know, the, you know, one of the, you know, the important things that you will want to get out of the Nyquist plot or the polar plot is when you cross the unit circle, right? The unit circle is the, is all points that have zero, uh, sorry, that have magnitude one. Magnitude one means magnitude zero dB, right? Where do I see the point where I cross the unit circle? These are the points that cross the zero dB line, okay? And what I see is that actually this happens here, okay? So, yeah, I, I mean, we can complete this thing, I'll say, so this is for omega roughly 10, I cross the, you know, the, the unit circle, right? But then what I want to know is what is the phase where I actually cross the unit circle and the phase is a little bit more negative than negative 90 degrees. So that's why I drew it there. Doesn't matter the exact location, okay? But you want to know that you cross this, 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 this unit circle, right? And then I, you know, essentially I never intersect the real axis. I only go to it asymptotically when omega goes to infinity, okay? Good, I think that, uh, um, okay. Well, let me just go, in, go for, for a minute until the, you know, the belt uh, rings. So, okay, so now we know how to do this body plot. We know how to draw the polar plot based on the body plot. How are we going, going to use it? Why do I need to know where it crosses the real line? Why do I need to know where it crosses the unit circle, so on and so forth, okay? And, okay, so this Nyquist, there is this Nyquist theorem, or this Nyquist, Nyquist criterion for closed-loop stability. Let me tell you the truth, is that everybody, including myself, hates Nyquist, okay? It's just it's a pain in the neck to just draw it, and it's, it's, it's not as easy as the other tools. So root locus, body plots, I do it in five seconds. I make mistakes, as you've seen, but you know, you essentially do it in, in five seconds. Nyquist plot usually takes a little bit more, okay? However, all of the other tools may be misleading or may not be usable in all circumstances. Nyquist is like that friend, you know, this depend, you know, that 
fan who is very dependable. It's kind of like a jerk, but <laughs> you don't really. But you know that you know when you really need him, uh, you know he's there for you. Okay. Um, and uh, right, so it's, this is the tool that, even though it's a little bit more of a pain to use, this is the one that will give you the right answer guaranteed. Okay. When in trouble, always double check with Nyquist. Okay. So. It's not nice, but uh, it's, it's very useful. Okay. Okay. So let's get started. Um, this is not the most fun thing that we do in this class, but let's do it. Okay. So essentially, the idea is the following: um, as you can imagine, uh, if I have, let's say, some function g of s, okay, some function of a complex variable, if I choose s as something that moves along a closed curve on the complex plane, right? So we know that S can, in general, is any complex, you know, is a complex number, right? So then I choose a, what is called a contour on the complex plane, that is the boundary of a, um, of a bounded, simply connected region, okay, of the complex, complex plane, right? So I just, in a sense, it's a closed curve, okay? So you can do all the mathematical definition you want, but, uh, essentially just draw a closed curve, then if I compute g of s for all the s's on this closed curve, what will I get? Well, it's another curve on the complex plane, okay? So this will be another closed curve on the complex plane. Now, something that is not obvious is the following, is that actually I do this thing, I compute this function, I draw this, you know, g of s when s moves on this curve. What happens is that the number of times that this curve goes around the origin for some magical reason gives you the number of poles and zeros that are contained of the function g that are actually contained in this contour. It's magic of complex analysis, okay? So we will give a quick explanation of why that happens. But, you know, so just keep that in mind, okay? So that now for some magical reason, just by counting how many times this curve goes around the origin, you know you essentially have a count of how many poles and how many zeros um, are within this contour, okay? And this is exactly what we will use uh, because really what we want to do when we are analyzing the closed-loop stability is we want to count how many poles the closed-loop transfer function has in the right half plane, right? And how many do we want that number to be? Zero, okay? So essentially what we want to do is we want to make sure that in the right half plane there are no poles of the closed-loop transfer function, Okay? And essentially what we want, you know, that's essentially what we want to test with the Nyquist, with the Nyquist criterion. Why is this the case? So let's assume that you're, um, so I have some transfer function with a zero here and a pole here, okay? And I choose as my, con my, uh, my contour this dashed line over here, okay? Now, Okay, so in this case, what I have is the g of s would be, you know, s minus z, I have one zero, over s minus p, I have one pole. If I take the argument, the angle of g, that is the, given just by the argument of s minus z minus the argument of s minus p. What is the argument of s minus p? Well, uh, s minus z. So essentially, I pick s on this curve, right? And the argument of S minus Z is just this, this angle, okay? Essentially, this angle here is, uh, sorry. So this angle here is the argument of S minus Z, right? Now, just eyeball, the, look at this figure, okay? And just try to think in your mind what happens to this argument as, to this angle as I move along this curve, right? So it starts here. Um, okay. Let's continue after the break. Um, 
So yeah, right now you may want to talk to Julian <laughs> about this season, okay? Okay, we will have more uh, of these things, uh, you know, next week and the week after. So they're all being shipped from China, and um, you know, hopefully we have enough for everybody. Okay. Uh, don't forget to get some sleep this weekend, okay? So I know that you will be so excited about playing with this. Um, well, anyway, I hope that you find it a useful tool to see some of the things that we do in class and how they apply uh, for real. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, I hope that, you know, I really hope that this will be fun for you and will be interesting and will be a way of, you know, seeing what everything we do in class actually means in the real world, okay? And the point is that it, you know, even though it may not be clear because we are always working complex numbers and frequencies and all these kind of abstract concepts, the practical implication is actually incredibly just right on the spot, okay? So may look like abstract theory is a very useful tool for actual design, okay? Anyway, so uh, let's get back to the lecture, right? So uh, again, um, you know, as you move around this, uh, this curve, right, uh, this angle is the, uh, the argument of the numerator, right, or the, or the argument of S minus Z, right? What do you think will happen to this argument as I move around this, this curve? Well, I start from here, this is, uh, say, negative 135 degrees, whatever, then it gets a little bit um, smaller, right? Um, right? Um, and then it will start increasing, and then eventually will go again to negative, to, to, sorry, to positive 135 degrees, roughly, right? But what you see is that, um, you know, if you think of it, if you were to draw um, this thing, is something that, say, starts from, for, um, um, you know, starts at, say, 135, then becomes a little bit smaller, becomes a little bit higher, and then goes back to 135, right? In particular, what you see is that the net, the total variation, the net variation from the beginning to the end of this number is actually zero, right? What happens to the pole? Well, it's kind of the same thing, right? So now I start with... Um, you know, the, um, you know, this number here is actually um, the argument of S minus P, right? And again, this is a number that starts from, say, 45 degrees, becomes a little bit smaller, right? And again, that gets back to 45, 30 degrees, whatever the number is, okay? Uh, in both cases, what you see is that, um, right, this is also something like that, right? Uh, no, actually. So this is just something like that, okay? And again, what you see is that the total variation of the argument of S minus P is again zero, right? Becomes a little bit smaller, becomes a little bit larger, but then goes back to exactly the same value, okay? Uh, and, you know, this is a particular case in which, as you see, there is no, even though the transfer function has both poles and zeros, none of the poles or zeros are contained within this contour. What changes if I actually now I draw my contour around one of those, around the zero, for example, okay? Uh, again, look at what happens to, uh, to this angle here, okay? So this is the argument of S minus Z. What you see is that I start from here, you see, say, you know, 90 degrees, right? And then as I move along this curve, this will become zero, we'll go to negative 90, right? We'll go to negative 180, uh, and then, you know, eventually we'll get back to, um, you know, think of it as a continuous, okay? So uh, negative 180, so here is actually negative, say, 181, right? <laughs> Something like that. So by the time that I get here, you will see that the, that argument has actually done gone through 360 degree, right? It has gone through two pi in the negative direction, right? So 
as I go around this curve, what you see is that this argument, this component, actually changes by 360 degrees, okay? So, and in particular, what you have done is you have essentially completed the circle. So, if, um, if you were to compute G of, uh, you know, G of S as I go through this contour, this function, since its argument goes from plus 90 to negative 270, it actually has done, completed the whole loop around the origin. Okay? Um, right? And, you know, this loop around the origin uh, will be a loop that is done in the, um, uh, in, in the positive direction, right? Um, and it's because they have this zero inside, inside the uh, transfer function, inside the, the contour, sorry. What is the effect of this pole? Well, the effect of this pole is, okay, you start from, say, 10 degrees, uh, as you move around the contour, will become, say, negative 10 degrees, and then goes up again to positive 10 degrees. So again, the total variation due to this pole is zero. Okay? Same thing for if I put this contour around the pole. The total variation from the zero, okay, we start from, say, minus 170 degrees, we'll go a little bit more negative, then it will become, we'll go back to negative 170 degrees, but the point is that the total variation is zero. Whereas the total variation from, for, you know, this angle is actually goes around the whole loop, right? So the total variation of that will be two pi or 360 degrees. See the difference? What is happening? So as long as the cur curve, no matter how complicated, but as long as this curve is, does not encircle zeros or poles, then the image of that curve under G, under the transfer function, will not encircle the origin. Okay? Will not make a complete loop around the origin. Okay? This is the magic. <laughs> so, and then essentially what you can say, I and mean, you can see it, you know, different ways. So, you know, let's say that we have a contour, right? And, you know, this is my contour, and then the number of times that the image of this contour will go around the origin is actually given by, essentially we have one loop for each zero and one loop in the negative direction for each pole, right? So the number of times that the image of this contour under the transfer, under your function will go around the origin is actually given by the number of zeros within your contour Minus the number, uh, minus the number of poles in, in in your contour. Okay, you see that. Um, okay, other ways that you can look at it is okay. So instead of having a contour that actually contains poles and zeros, you can imagine that you have, you know, another contour where you make like a small, you know, cuts. Okay. Um, and then you can think of it, so now the total number of, of encirclements of the origin when you follow this contour with cuts will be zero because there are no poles and zero within that contour, right? But you can imagine that, you know, the number of encirclement, now imagine that you have, um, um, now I, I redraw this as just this one, right? And then I have this one. Um, okay. And I have this one here, right? Okay. So you can think of it, you know, the integral, you know, or, you know, essentially what happens along those curves. It gives you, um, you know, the total number of encirclement. Um, for the, this external curve, um, so, sorry, the total number of encirclements of the origin by the contour of the purple region is equal to the number of encirclements by this larger curve minus the number of encirclements from this one and this one, okay? So you can look, look, look at it in you know, different ways, but essentially what you have to remember is that whenever you take a, a contour on the complex plane, then the number of times that the image of that contour will go around the origin, 
counts the number of zeros minus the number of poles in your contour. Okay? So how do we use this? Remember that what we want to figure out is, given an open loop transfer function, we want to know how many poles of the closed loop transfer function will be unstable, right? So will be in the right half plane. Okay? So, number of steps, right? So for closed loop stability, what we want is that the closed loop poles, they must have negative real parts. So they must not be in the right half plane, okay? Now, what are the closed loop poles? If you remember, the closed loop poles are actually the, the roots or the zeros of the characteristic polynomial, right? And the characteristic polynomial is one plus K L of S, right? Uh, so essentially this is assuming that what I have here is, you know, this is my loop transfer function, okay? For convenience, I will put again K here, right? And then I do my feedback. Okay? So essentially, we are thinking of this setup. Okay? Um, what is the closed loop transfer function for this? Right? So I know that the closed loop transfer function, which we call the complementary sensitivity, right? Um, is what? K L of S over 1 plus K L of S, right? So in order to assess the stability of the closed loop, really what we had to look is, you know, what are the uh, zeros of 1 plus K L of S, okay? Which will be the poles of, of my closed loop transfer function, okay? So the poles of 1 plus K L of S are actually the poles of L of S, right? This is the same thing, right? So what are the, the values for which this goes to infinity is the same as the values for which this goes to infinity, okay? Now, what I, uh, you know, again, you know, what we want to know is, and, you know, so the poles of 1 plus K L of S is something that we know because they are exactly the same as the open loop poles, you know, the poles of L of S, okay? Now, what I would like to check is how many zeros of this transfer function are actually, so how many zeros of this polynomial are in the right half plane? So how do I do that? Essentially, what we do is, can we use the, I mean, technically, we would like to have the whole right half plane as our contour, right, as our region. <coughs> can you draw a contour about around an infinite region? No. Right? So what we will do is we will construct what is called this D contour, okay? Um, so technically what we would like to do is the following, right? So this is the complex plane. Technically what we would like to have is capture, draw a curve around all of the right half plane, right? We cannot really do that, so we will be just, you know, happy enough with drawing a contour that just moves along the imaginary axis, okay? Then for some large number, we'll kind of like go around in a circle and then come back, you know, to the imaginary axis, you know, from below, okay? Guess why this is called a decontour, right? The shape is, <laughs> is kind of clear, right? Okay, so now you should think of this as something that is technically uh, this decontour closes at infinity. Of course, we cannot draw a curve at infinity, but then think of it as just make this radius a large a number that is finite, but is so large that it doesn't matter, <laughs> okay? Okay, so think of it as a finite but very large radius, okay? So then what we know from what we've done so far is that as I move S, along this contour, right, then the plot of one plus K L of S, which again, this will be a polar plot, okay? And in particular, since I'm moving S from negative frequencies side, this will actually be that Nyquist plot, okay? This is both the polar plot and it's symmetric, okay? So then what we know is that as S moves along the boundary of this region, 
the polar plot of 1 plus k L of s encircles the origin a number of times that is given by you know, n times, which is given by z minus p, where z is what? So z is the zeros of this function in this region, right? So then this would be the unstable closed loop poles, right? The zeros of one plus k L are actually the closed loop poles. The zeros that happen to be in the right half plane are the unstable closed loop poles, the bad things, okay? P is actually the number, so is the uh, number of poles of one plus um, um, K L of S, which corresponds to the number of poles of the open loop transfer function, which happen to be within this D contour, okay? So then P is the number of unstable open loop poles, okay? And at this point, this is just kind of like analysis, right? Um, you can rephrase the same statement as in the following way. Um, um, okay. <laughs> um, just moves the, um, you know, as S moves along the boundaries of the region. Now, instead of drawing another polar plot of 1 plus K L of S, and then drawing a number of different plots for different values of K, what you will do is the following. Just draw the polar plot of L of S, which is what we did, what we did in, the, in, the, in the first hour, right? Notice, we didn't plot, we didn't draw the polar plot of 1 plus L of S. We, draw, we drew the polar plot of L of S, okay? So, now what you say is that if 1 plus K L of S encircles the origin, is the same thing as saying that L of S encircles the point minus one over k. Just translating. You're just translating, you know, your, your complex plane, okay? So then, um, um, you know, just draw the polar plot of L of S, and then this polar plot will encircle the minus one over k point a number of times, which is given by z is the number of unstable closed loop poles, and p is again the number of unstable open loop poles. Okay. As we said before, the symmetry of poles and zeros implies that, you know, essentially the, the Nyquist plot is the mirror image of the polar plot, okay? And, uh, and, and again, you know, the, number, the key feature really is how many times you, in, you go around the minus one over k point, okay, for different values of k. And now you see, this is why I say that really the key point in drawing the Nyquist plot is finding where it intersects the real axis, because where is minus one over k? For whatever value of k, minus one over k will be a point on the, on the real axis, right? Will be on the negative real axis for k positive, but will be on the positive real axis for k negative, okay? And now we get into the end, okay? So now we have a closed loop system with a transfer function, we'll say loop transfer function L of S, possibly with a gain K, right? You know that this transfer function, this is the open loop transfer function, has P poles in the region enclosed by the Nyquist contour, which is essentially the right half plane, okay? Then what you know, N is the net number of clockwise encirclements of minus one over k, okay? Uh, as, as moves along this Nyquist contour in the um, clockwise direction, okay? So then the closed loop system has z poles in the Nyquist contour that is in the right half plane where z is given by n plus p, okay? So n is the number of encirclements, p is the number of open loop unstable poles, right? In particular, if the open loop system is stable, meaning that P is zero, then in order for uh, your closed loop system to be stable, you want your Nyquist plot never to encircle the negative one over K point. Okay? We will look at these conditions, we'll do some examples, okay? If on the other hand, the open loop system has 
P unstable poles, then in order to have Z equal to zero, what you want to have is N equal to negative P. What does it mean to have N is equal to negative P? What you need to have is um, you know, a number of encirclements of the of negative encirclements that is equal to the number of uh, open loop poles, uh, open loop unstable poles. What is a negative encirclement? Is an encirclement that happens in the opposite direction with respect to the direction which you are following the decontour. So, if you're following the decontour in the clockwise direction, a negative encirclement is an encirclement of the negative one over k point which happens in the clock counterclockwise direction. Complicated, sounds worse than it is. Let's look at you know, some examples, okay? Okay, so this is the Nyquist condition for a single real stable pole, okay? So now what we have is L of S is given by two over S plus one. Um, this is the, um, you know, this is the, um, you know, uh, what we have here is just the pole zero map, right? So we just have, um, you know, um, you know this pole here. What does the um, what does the Nyquist plot of this system look like? So what we want to draw? I mean, we did it before, right? So that's a little bit different. So for omega goes to zero, this is two, right? So we are starting from um, from two, right? And phase is zero. What I know is that the magnitude will go to zero for large magnitude and the phase will go to negative 90, right? So what I know is that, um, uh, sorry. What we know is that the polar plot will look something like that. And then if I close, um, you know, if I do the mirror image for negative frequencies, what I get is this, okay? Now, you know, we can think of different location for the negative one over k point. Now, uh, let's say the k is equal to one, okay? Um, so if k is equal to one, then the negative one over k is here, right? Yeah? yeah. Could you explain again how you got to the first force? Which one? The circle? This is the same thing that we did before for the polar plot of uh, 1 over S plus P, right? Um, uh, yeah, you can draw, I mean, you can, you know, what does the body plot of this look like? Let's do it. So a few seconds, right? So the body plot is, um, is essentially starts from 2, right? And then when the frequency gets to 1, goes down by 20 dB per decade, okay? So this is the magnitude. Uh, what happens to the phase? We, start, we know that it starts from zero, then, then the frequency gets to one, uh, is negative 45, and then eventually goes to negative 90 degrees, right? Okay, so now we have something that starts from two with a phase of zero, right? Which is two, the number two, the real number two, okay? And then I know that we'll go to magnitude zero, we'll go to the origin, but coming to the origin from a phase of negative 90 degrees, okay? Now, you know, again, you know, so, so here the, the important thing is the exact shape of this, of this curve doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is that the, essentially, the phase is zero here, right? So we are crossing the, the real line here, and then we are approaching the real line here, okay? So these are really the only two things that that matter, okay? So now, for k is equal to one, what happens to your closed loop? Who can tell me whether the closed loop will be stable or not? Remember that, um, you know, the number of closed loop unstable poles is given by n plus p, okay? Z is the number of very bad things when you close the loop, right? So you want to keep that to zero. <coughs> N is the number of times that this curve in, goes around the minus one over K point, okay? P is the number of unstable open loop poles. In this case, how much is P? Anybody? 
how many unstable open loop poles do we have? Come on. <laughs> one? Why? Now we have, we have one pole, but you see that the pole is stable, right? So, um, um, so you only have one stable pole, meaning that you have no unstable poles, right? So P is actually zero in this case. Uh, somebody else raised their hands? No? Okay. Okay? So P in this case is zero. Okay? Now, how many times do I encircle the minus one over k point, where minus one over k is here, right? If I choose k is equal to one. So how many times does this curve go around this point here? Anybody? <laughs> zero. zero, right? So in this case, what we know is that, so P is zero, this curve goes around the, neg the negative one point zero times, so for k is equal to one, the closed loop system will be stable, right? Now, what if I choose, what if, if I tell you that the k now is some other number, which is positive, right? Minus one over k, let's say somewhere here. What can you say? For what values of positive k will my closed loop be stable? Does it matter whether this point is here or here or here? How many times am I encircling it? Zero, right? So actually what I know is that for <clears throat> any positive value of k, my closed loop will be stable. Amazing, okay? However, what happens when k is, for example, negative one, right? So if k is negative one, then my minus one over k will be here, right? What happens in that case? <laughs> How many encirclements? Well, one. one, right? So know that if I choose k to be negative one, then I will have one encirclement, meaning that I will have one unstable closed loop pole. So my, my, my closed loop system will be unstable. Does it mean that for any negative value of K, my closed loop will be stable? Well, no, right? Because I can have, you know, what if minus one over K is out here, right? So that will happen for K negative and small, right? If minus one over K is here, what happens to the closed loop? How many encirclements do we have? Zero. So the closed loop will be stable. Okay? So essentially what we found is that, you know, now K, you know, the closed loop will be stable for all values of K, all positive values of K, right? And for negative values of K that are small enough. Okay? Okay? Uh, in particular, you know, this is why you need to know where you intersect the, um, the real axis because on you know, this point is actually two. Right? So what is the largest negative value of K that you can use and still have a stable closed loop? <coughs> Minus one half, okay? Now, okay, I hope you get the point. You know, we'll do more and more of this and uh, I understand you, everybody hates Nyquist, in me included, but you know, really, when you're in trouble, when a complicated system, try to do Nyquist and, you know, gives you the correct answer, okay? But, <clears throat> you know, the point is that actually, how does this compare to the root locus? But, you know, what is the root locus telling us? What is the root locus of this system? The root locus for positive K is just the negative real axis to the left of the pole, right? So we know that <clears throat> for positive K, the root locus also tell us that any positive K will result in a stable closed loop, right? What is the root locus for negative K? Well, it will be this. Lo and behold, what does it mean? Essentially what, what, we, what, we, say, what we see is that also the root locus is telling us that the closed loop will be stable for negative gains as long as the, um, you know, uh, as long as the, Gain is in magnitude small, right? But then for large 
negative gains, what you get is an unstable closed loop, which is exactly what Nyquist is telling us, okay? So essentially the summary of this is that, you know, the closed loop is stable for k uh, essentially greater than negative one half, okay? Good. Uh, okay, so we have, you know, like a more complicated ones uh, here. Um, um, okay, uh, what is the uh, what is the Nyquist plot of this thing? Um, you know, this is kind of complicated, right? So, what we want to do is um, uh, let's do the body plot first. Okay, uh, what does the body plot look like? We start at where do we start? Notice that here we have a one. We have one um, unstable open loop pole, right? Because the open loop poles are at positive one and negative one. Then we have a minimum phase zero at, say, negative two, okay? What does the body plot look like in this case? So what we have is, okay, so we have two poles at one, right? But one of the poles is stable, the other one is unstable, right? So what will happen is, okay, so the magnitude will go up to here. So we have two poles, right? And then we have a zero here at two. So the magnitude will go down by two dB per decade around here. Then we'll kind of like flatten out to negative one dB per decade, you know, after we get to the zero, right? What happens to the frequency? Uh, so this is the magnitude. What happens to the phase? Um, okay, it will be zero. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so this is why you had to always put these things in this uh, body form, right? Because, uh, and you know, which is actually almost not the case. So let's write it as minus one half, minus two, say, times s over two plus one, and then minus s squared plus one. Uh, the reason why I'm, I'm writing it this way is that you see that the body gain is actually negative two, right? So what we know is that for very low frequencies, actually my uh, body plot is starting from negative, uh, well, in this case, is starting from negative two, right? Okay? Good, so our, you know, um, okay, so we are starting from, um, from say, you know, negative 180 degrees. What happens to the phase? Um, you know, I encountered these two poles, right? But one pole is stable, the other pole is unstable, uh, so they actually cancel each other, okay? Uh, because the uh, unst stable pole will bring the phase down by 90 degrees, this, the unstable pole will bring it up by 90 degrees. So essentially they cancel, right? Uh, and then what we have is just the zero and the phase will increase by 90 degrees, okay? So the body plot in this case is actually, the polar plot in this case is starting from here, from negative two for very low frequencies, right? And then it's going to the origin, but coming to the origin from, um, um, what is it? Um, from essentially negative uh, 90 degrees, okay? So it's going this way. And then we had the, the mirror image is something like that, okay? Again, what can you tell me? Uh, what will happen if my, uh, if I, for a gain of one, okay? So the minus one over K point will be here. So, uh, I know that Z is equal to N plus P. P in this case is how many? Is how much? How many open loop unstable poles? So P is one, right? So, okay. How many encirclements do we, do we have if K is equal to one? That is my minus one over K is here. How many encirclements? How many times does my Nyquist plot go around this point? 
Look at it. It's no math. It's minus one, right? So you do go around this point once, and you do that in the negative direction. You do it counterclockwise. Okay? So then, for k is equal to one, what can you say about the uh, stability of the closed loop system? So n is negative one plus one. I get zero. The total number of unstable closed loop poles is zero. Amazing. Okay. What what happens if I actually use if my minus one over k point is over here? That that happens for a very small value of k, right? If my minus one over k point will be here, what can you say about how many times do I encircle the negative one over k point? Zero. Zero. So what does it mean for the closed loop system? The closed loop system, so n will be zero, but I still have one unstable closed loop pole. Okay? What happens for negative gains? Number of encirclements is zero. Right? So again, what we found is that, um, and you know, by the way, what is this number? Essentially, what we want is that for k larger, you know, for k sufficiently large, actually, I know that my closed loop system will be stable. How much is sufficiently large? So this point is negative two, right? So again, so what we know is that for, uh, you know, the closed loop system is stable for k larger than one half, okay? What does the root locus tell us? Uh, let's draw the root locus for this thing. Well, what I know is that this part will be on the positive root locus. This will be on the positive root locus. What does the root locus look like? Well, in this case, it's something like this, right? And then one closed loop pole goes to the open loop zero. The other closed loop poles goes to negative infinity, right? And now what you see is that, okay, so for very small values of k, then the closed loop poles will be somewhere, you know, one of the closed loop poles will still be in the unstable region, right? But eventually, as I increase k, both of them will be somewhere in the left half plane. Okay? <coughs> what is the root locus for uh, negative k? Well, it's something like that, okay? So you see that for negative k, you will always have a close, unstable closed loop pole, okay? So you see that in these cases, root locus, Nyquist give you exactly the same result. Great. Now, what happens when you have open loop poles on the imaginary axis, okay? And this is when, you know, this is something that, you know, students typically hate, okay? And everybody hates it. <laughs> so essentially what you want to do is, um, essentially you don't want to draw the, your contour in such a way that it crosses a pole, right? Because at that point, you know, uh, how can you say if the pole is outside or inside? the contour, you don't, right? So what you will do is typically make this uh, like a small indentations, you know, around, <coughs> excuse me, around these, uh, these poles, okay? And just do the decontour in exactly the same way, okay? Now, what happens when the, and you know, think of this as very small little indentation, okay? like infinitely small, right? What happens as your G of S, G of J omega, gets to, uh, where S gets to close to these poles. What will happen is that, you know, the poles are the values for which your Lutrasser function goes to infinity, right? So then essentially the Nyquist plot will also go to infinity. What you have to be careful about is how you close that as you, as you, as you, as you complete, as you complete your, your Nyquist plot. Let's, let's look at how it works, okay? So what is the Nyquist plot of this thing here? For very small omega, for, very, for s equals zero, what is the polar plot? It's two, right? Right? Substitute s equals zero, what you get is just two. What happens when s goes to infinity? Okay, where j omega, where omega goes to infinity? What you have is a total of three poles, meaning that your phase at infinity will go to, how much? 
negative 270, right? So what we know is that the, this polar plot will look like something like that, okay? And then we can look at the mirror image, something like that. Uh, sorry, no, it's completely screwed up. No. <laughs> okay, I know that I start from here, and I know that I will eventually come into the origin from this direction. Okay? However, look at, you know, what happens here. So, um, um, as I'm moving my, my point along this direction, what you see at some point, I'm getting close to this pole, meaning that the magnitude of my response will go to infinity. Right? Okay? And um, yeah, in this particular case, what would be the magnitude of my, of my um, um, uh, frequency response? Uh, sorry, the phase of my frequency response. At this point, how much is it? What I have is essentially I have zero from this pole. So sorry, I have zero from this pole. I have negative 90 from this pole. Right, and then I have about 45 degrees from this pole, right? So my phase when I approach this thing will be what? Is um, uh, um, uh, sorry, so it's positive 90, positive 90 from this, negative 90 from this, which cancel out. And then I have 45 degrees from this, right? So my uh, magnitude at that point would be uh, essentially four, negative 45 degrees, right? But I know that my Nyquist plot is actually going to infinity, okay? It's going to infinity at about 45 degrees, negative 45 degrees, okay? Then it will come back at this point, and, you know, and the phase, uh, what will the phase be, at, you know, here? Would be... 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 45, so it will be negative 225, right? So I know that I will eventually come back from this direction, okay? Right? And, uh, and then eventually it will, will go to, you know, my polar plot will go to zero, okay? Um, you can do the, you know, what, what does the... Um, body plot of this look like. Um, you know, all of these are at uh, essentially one, right? So what I will have is, um, you know, my magnitude will go to infinity, right? Because I have, you know, the damping ratio of this is zero, right? We'll go to infinity and then decrease by, you know, 60 dB per decade, okay? What happens to the phase? So this is the magnitude plot. What happens to the phase? It starts from zero, right? Then essentially goes, uh, you know, fairly quickly to negative 270, okay? Now, the point, the critical point here is how you close. So I know that I go to infinity here and I come back from infinity here. So how do I close this curve? When you go around this, this, this decontour, when you go around this pole, you do it in this, uh, you see, in the counterclockwise direction. So what it means is that you have to close this in the clockwise direction, okay? Okay? So just answer, so if, uh, if, uh, if K was equal to one, how many encirclements do I have? Just give me one second, okay? Just conclude this, this slide. How many encirclements do I have here? How many times do I go around this thing? I go around it two times, okay? And I go around it two times in the positive direction, so I will have two unstable poles, okay? Uh, let's finish this next time, okay? So I'll see you next week.